Hey, welcome back, guys. Mob Vlog. I am here with Bob. Please welcome Mr. Red We Met. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Hello, folks. It's another Monday, and here I am. And let's let's say hi to some of you folks. Catherine Guerrero. Duchess is fine. This can't be wrong. Oh, Kirsch Meyer just got my mustache. How <laughs> sorry. Okay. Hey, I think the crew's doing good. A lot of you folks in here. Phil Kirschmeyer, good to see you. Good to see you, folks. Don Vito. Good to see you. <laughs> Frank Ferrero, it's going well. It's going very well. The truth. Haven't caught Lee on the show in weeks. Can't do that anymore. <laughs> you got it. You got it, guy. That's my opinion. And hello to you, Miss Can't Be Wrong. So, I'm going to start out by saying, well, I've got to say hi to Bobby Baker Donuts. He's saying hi to Ted. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to start out by uh, giving you a rundown on Kurt, and then you can ask some questions after that. Um, it's... Kurt, I started out with Kurt. I met him through uh, my uncle, my uncle Roy, who was a real stone cold al alcoholic. And he was dating Marion McGann, who was uh, uh, Kurt's sister. And um, I was just out of the Marine Corps. I was looking for a job. And I was kind of finding myself, too. And I asked Marion, I went over to see my uncle and I met Marion and I asked Marion, um, uh, <laughs> Sean Pender. I asked Marion, uh, uh, she asked me some questions. She asked me if I had a job and I said, no. And she picked up the phone, called her brother, Kurt collect. And she said, this is collect. The operator said that we have a collect call from Marion McGann or Marion. And Kurt would pick up the phone and say, no, I won't accept the charges. And then he would call her back on a call pack that he had. So he didn't, she didn't have to pay for the calls. And um, he said, why don't you, um, uh, uh, she said, oh, by the way, we're coming out this weekend. And she asked me if I had a car, I was going to drive him out there. And I did. And um, she said, also, uh, you're giving Roy's nephew a job. Very demanding. As a matter of fact, and Kurt said, okay. Oh, you know, he just went along with whatever Marion said. He really loved her. He really did. So that's how I got out to the Valley View Yak. And um, after after I got out there, um, I actually witnessed Kurt murder somebody. And when I did, I left. He told me to leave in the middle of the night. And... Um, a lot of things happened where I met his brother, Hanson, uh, Kenny Hanson, who murdered three little boys. As Sky, that was way before. That was on the north side of Chicago. But he showed me his directions to Sky High Stables, where I spent the night. And I wrote about it in my book. But at any rate, what happened was, Kurt decided later on, after he torched his own Valley View Yak, thinking he had insurance on it, but he didn't pay the premiums. 
and Ken Hansen's wife was divorcing him for uh, many reasons. <laughs> and so they were both kind of down in the dumps and they were looking for somebody like me. And so what I did was I, um, I, made an agreement to go into the porn shops. I was tending bar at the Nocturne, which was owned by Bill Niff. It was on Burton Place. It was upstairs. And um, that's how it all got started. Before that, uh, I was running slot machines uh, out in the Chicago Heights with Kurt. Now, Kurt was a hitman. There were several people he killed. One of the people that I know about that he killed mm -hmm. was one of Sam DeStefano's De collectors mm -hmm. that was supposed to be collecting from or street taxing uh, Ken Hansen when he had a, a bar over on 95th Street, 95th and Keene. So at any rate, uh, that was the, the time I went, went down to the basement uh, of Sam DeStefano. Something else I can tell you about Kurt. Kurt... Um, dated Sam Stefano's daughter. And Sam told him, you better have her in here by 10 o'clock at night. And Kurt was afraid of him. Kurt was definitely afraid of him. Kurt was also involved with Cy Jane and Sammy D, Sammy D. Stefano, um, throughout the years. And when I did go into business with him, uh, he cut his brother out of the business and he started to muscle me out. He told me never to come around again. I was uh, shot at by him uh, underneath the L tracks by 11th and state. Uh, the bullets were bouncing off the girders and I was just jumping around from place to place to place. Uh, eventually what happened with Kurt was um, he had a brain aneurysm and uh, he uh, had surgery. And he became a vegetable, which is his worst fear, because we had been at the Heinz VA hospital bringing something to his friends. And we saw these people hanging on uh, young men that were Vietnam vets that were hanging on. Uh, they were quadriplegic. They were in like. Uh, uh, I can't name the fabric. It's uh, a real tough fabric. And they were hanging on the wall. And Kurt told me not to bother with them. And he said, wouldn't that be living hell? Well, that's the way it wound up. It was living hell. He passed on. How you doing, Anthony? So he didn't pass on right then. He didn't die till 1993. And I made sure he was uh, dead before I uh, or incapacitated, not dead, in 19... 87, 1988, I went out to see him. And uh, that was it. Outfit boss, I, I just answered that question, buddy. I met him through Marion McGann, his sister. She lived at 56, 56 North Claremont. My uncle Roy was dating her. And that's how I first met him. And he warned me about him. He said, this guy kills people. He doesn't mess around. And after I watched, watched him witness it, it was really, I knew he was a bad guy. He was a very bad guy. Scott H., uh, Kurt was a World War II veteran. He was a Marine. He was uh, twice decorated as with a Silver Star for, at the Battle of Iwo Jima. Uh, he brought home all kinds of souvenirs, samurai swords and everything. They all burned up in the fire at Valley View Yak that he torched himself with Larry Savaggio. Um, it was it was a kind of an interesting thing. But um, hi, Mike. How you doing? Um, it's uh, he was a bad man, very bad man. And until Marshall Cofano straightened him out for me when I was upset, I uh, because he, he told me, even though the lease was in my name, he told me never to come back to the store um, to just get out of there. 
and I did. But I, I kept the combination of the safe, and I also kept the keys. I didn't give them to him. He didn't ask for them. He just was in anger. He told me to go away. So I did. I went looking for Marshall Cofano, and I gave him the keys because he was a partner. And I said, I'm through. That's it. I thought you people were men of honor. And I walked away. And through a series of circumstances that I've described before, um, Marshall said, come on, get in the car. We're going over to take your store back. And he threw Kurt out. He told him to kill him if he ever talked to me again. And that's how it went. Kurt made a lot of stupid mistakes. One of them, killing people. I mean, he was a hitman. We're not talking about like uh, Frank Collada where he killed two people because he had to clean up his mess. Somebody told him to go out and shoot somebody. He did. One of his early, in 1964, one of his early problems, he lived in Elmhurst at that time. I didn't know him then, but um, he told me about it and other people told me about it. Uh, I believe it was Tommy Durso that went out to see him in Elmhurst. They hung him in the basement from the rafters, pulled his pants down and um, hit him with a cattle prod in his genitals, um, trying to get him to talk about the murder he committed. He never talked. So he was tough, he was stupid, and he was dangerous, very dangerous. And that's the beginning. So let's go on to the Q&As here. <laughs> no, Frank Schweiss did not like him, and he didn't have anything to do with him, period. Uh, outfit boss. Uh Hey, Red, do you think that Frank the German Schweiss was gay and that's why he was so crazy? No, John Wayne, I really don't. Ricky, it's unknown how many hits he actually did do. Um, the ones that I know about are um, he killed a police officer. And uh, it still isn't cleared. A detective uh, called me from the sheriff's department. He'd like to clear it. It occurred in 1967 when I wasn't there. And he told me about how he did it. It was with a 41 Magnum pistol. And uh, they were very rare at the time. They were new. I don't think they've lasted. I don't think they even make 41 Magnums anymore. Uh, as as how many hits he actually did, Scott H., I really don't recall the exact amount. There was so much that happened after I went to the north side and I got away from him, I just couldn't really tell you for sure, honestly. But there were, I would say it was over 20 in his lifetime. He was a shooter, and he beat people to death. The guy I watched him kill... He beat him with a blackjack, and he beat him to death. And it was a, um, he was a booking agent. And at the Valley View Yak, they only paid $500 for anybody that would come in. Poco Harum, Buddy Rich, top X. But when he got him, they had a play there before they went down to Mr. Kelly's or something on Rush Street to play. So... These big bands, orchestras, I mean, it didn't even pay for their gas money to get there. And I'm sure he didn't want to pay the agent, the booking agent. That's why he killed them. They argued over it. Okay. Let's go into this. Uh, Don Chichin, <laughs> do you know if he ever worked with Billy Dauber? No, he never did work with Billy Dauber. Uh, he was way before Billy Dauber. Um, it was a whole different... Uh, there's nothing on the internet about him. I can't find anything about him. Really. The only thing I can find on the internet about him is he ran into a burning house as a youth before he went to the Marine Corps, 
and saved his uh, family because they were the house was burning down and he saved his little brother Kenny, um, the gay brother, and he uh, also saved his sister Marion. Uh, Glenn, hey Red, did Lefty Rosenthal report to Marshall Cofano? Uh, yes, when he was out in Las Vegas, he did. When he's out in Las Vegas, he did. The most famous hit, I mean, the most dynamic to me was uh, uh, the uh, murder of one of Sam Stefano's collectors that was trying to collect. But the most famous one that he did, he got away with, and he's not known for it. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a deputy that's uh, trying to contact me to close the case and actually give a statement on Zoom about it. When Ker William Kirschmar, who ordered Kurt to, to do certain hits? Uh, one was um, uh, Fifi Bouchieri. And then one was Jimmy Katura, and several were done with people that I didn't know because they were before my time. The truth. Sorry, we've got to say it, Red We met. We didn't know. Sorry, I've got to say it, Red We met. No. We didn't know, at least not yet. Well, you're right. How old was I when I met Kurt? I was 21 years old when I met Kurt. Scott H., you asked how old I was. I was 21 years old. This has not related to this, but John Wayne, who is more powerful, Big Tuna or Paul Rica? I think there were equals. That's what I believe. I don't think one was more power than the other. Hans Gruber. Um, what crew was Kurt under? It was always the South Side. And he was under, um, until we went to Joey Lombardo. Um, and then he was ousted there, uh, the North Side. But he was under uh, the Heights crew in Chicago Heights and um, that sort of thing. Scott H., Red, do you think Tony killed the guys in Lake Mead? I have no idea. What I think is irrelevant. I mean, I wouldn't even guess on that one. It's a stupid joke based on your name, Red. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, D-Truth. John Wayne, you're welcome. The truth. Red is Gray's Lake, Illinois' mob turf. I don't know. I really don't. I have no idea. Michael Graham, of all the things the Hansons were involved in and the Schussler and Peterson, Peterson murders is the worst. Yeah, it is the worst. And I would say what comes in second is the murder of Helen Brock. They just, they, Vic Spalaccio and um, Ken Hansen and Kurt Hansen and one other gentleman, gentleman, <laughs> idiot. Uh, disposed of the body. It was in Ken Hansen's. They drove it to Ken Hansen's uh, stable at Sky High Stables in Tinley Park, 17201 Central. And then after that, they took it to the, took her, her, you know, her body to the, um, after Joe Plemons put the coup de gras on her head uh, in the arena, they took her to the uh, steel mills and she was uh, dumped into a, a vat of molten steel.
John Wayne, Red Kurt, or Frank the German, or Lurch? Who is the more scarier? Uh, I never met uh, Lurch, so I really couldn't tell you. Um, I would say probably Kurt, uh, Lurch was more scary because he's totally unpredictable. I really couldn't. Yes, you're right, Miss Can't Be Wrong. Murders of those boys is absolutely horrible. And the reason for it is even worse. Hanson was 22 years old at the time, Ken Hanson. And um, I was obviously gay. And uh, he molested uh, a lot of boys, young boys. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, 14, 13, and 11 years old, um, he molested at least one of them that he told me. And uh, I jump started that investigation 26 later, 26 years later that uh, Mike Parker kind of put me off on in an interview. He said that, uh, why didn't I come forward earlier than that? And I told him, the FBI told me not to. The FBI was totally aware of it, but they didn't want to do it. Michael Graham, yes, I agree, Red. I believe that Helen Brock was going to blow the whistle on their horse schemes. She was. She even announced it when she got back from uh, Rochester, Minnesota, from her annual physical. She was calling an IBI uh, agent, and she was Illinois Bureau of Investigation, and she was going to tell them about the whole thing. And the mistake she made was she let it be known, and they couldn't have that. Let's see. Let's get back up here. Yes, he did kill him. Um, Joe Plemons, uh, Miss Can't Be Wrong. Um, Joe Plemons testified in court that uh, back in 1955, if you were gay and you were involved in molesting somebody, you probably never even made it to jail. So the easiest way was to kill them and throw their bodies in a ditch. And... He was 22. The boys were 14, 13, and 11. Scott H. Did Kurt have any children? If so, how 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 did they turn out? Um, he did have um, two children by his first wife, and um, I don't know how they turned out. He lived in Elmhurst. He gave her the house. That was after he was tortured in the basement by Durso. He gave her the house, and um, I never met the kids. I heard a lot about them. I don't even know. She remarried, and I don't know their names or whatever happened to them. John Wayne. I love these mob stories, but most, most of the guys are <laughs> so fucking evil that it makes it stomach turning. Yes, it is. It really is. And I really saw a lot of evil. I really did. There was so much evil. It really was. It was bad. Good afternoon, Herman. How you doing? Scott H., the FBI knows a lot of stuff but covers it up for, to protect their sources. Yes, they did. Uh, street stories. Mike Parker was a fathead and a sensationalist. He was more than that, as far as I'm concerned. I have, uh, I don't know why he, he ambushed me like that. It was terrible. Uh, Miss can't be wrong. So he walked around free for 22 years. No, he walked around free. From 1955 until 1994, when they made the arrest. So you do the math. This can't be wrong.
JW, did people who own gay porn shops film their own videos? No one that I know of except me. And I did not film any gay any gay material at all. Mine, it, it, it may have been frequent and, and gay friendly, but it was uh, it was mixed. It was a mixed crowd, and we did a lot of things. Michael Graham, unfortunately for their victims, Hanses were great con men and were able to gain people's trust. You are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. I describe Kurt in my book as a jolly fat man. And when I found out who he really was, it was a nightmare. It really was a nightmare. Kurt is not alive. He died in 1993. And we can't even find a grave on him. There's nothing on the internet about Kurt Hansen. We can't find anything about him. I mean, I've had other people look. And we just can't find anything. Nick Perez. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. Another Monday. Smeller 7. Hi, folks. Well, hi to you, sir. How you doing? Joe Clark. Hey, Red. Sorry for being late. Hey, don't be sorry you're here. God bless you, dear. Gerald, Gerald. Hello, Red. Well, how old are you, Gerald Darrow? Uh, Robert 0969. Uh, Red, would you say your porn store was a mixed bag of nuts? No, I would say what I just said, Robert. No, Kurt never did prison time. He never did prison time. JW, was the porn business strictly a cash business? No, I ran credit cards. And uh, I didn't have a problem with that. Hanson on Green Acres stable behind my cousin's house. No, he didn't own it. He did lease it for a while. Adam Cram, what read? What did Kurt think? Um, I'd say he was a racist. I really do. <laughs> he used the N word a lot. John Apollo, Apollo, how about some likes for Red? Thank you, buddy. I really appreciate that. I need all the likes I can get. I, I thank all of you for showing up today. I really do. Paul Clinton, uh, hey, Red, I asked you a I asked a question a few times about the German concerning his body when it was exhumed. Do you know, recall, uh, how it appeared? I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm going to take a guess at what you're asking. Uh, it was totally uh, decomposed. The only way to identify it was through a DNA. However, his daughter, Nora, uh, she wanted to actually view it. And she was cautioned not to, but she's a very strong-headed woman, and she's very demanding. And she did finally see him. I don't think she could really recognize him. JW, off the record, 
when did the credit card come out? When did I start using credit cards? Um, 1977, I started using credit cards. Red, I know Capone was before your time, but did you ever hear any of the old timers say what he was like? No, the only one I heard uh, talked about, John Wayne, was Ralph Capone. He was out in Willow Springs, and his nickname was Bottles. And he's the man that's responsible for putting the dates on milk. Not Ralph Capone, or not Al Capone, but in one of um, Frank Schweiss's statements, he says, this is a declared joint. I don't care. If uh, Al Capone's brother comes back from the dead, nobody has the right to come in and mess with you guys. Mm. But Ryan Brown, Unbridled Rage is about Ken Hansen murdering three little boys, and Kurt has talked about in a bit. Yeah, and you know, Jimmy Jack, I don't know, Unbridled Rage is, um, I forget which one did that. Uh, there were several books written. Unbridled Rage was, I'm not sure who it was written, but uh, people took liberties in there that weren't exactly accurate. They really weren't. Adam Cram. A Cram? Was Kurt Hansen in the cocaine business? No, he wasn't. Uh, they didn't even, cocaine wasn't even popular then. This can't be wrong. Nora is something else. She did see him. So she said, okay. John Apollo, Apollo. Hey, Red. Did you know a guy named Gordy? He worked on horses at the stable. No, I did not know him. John Wayne. Yeah, I know about the bottles Capone. Thank you, John. Most people don't. Tony V. Hey, Red, anybody in Chicago have connections with Gangster? And I think you're talking about Menin, Arkansas. Uh, not that I know of. Michael Graham, Red has a bedtime story on the video on his channel about the Hansons and Helen Brock, for those viewers that didn't see it. Yes, I do. And thank you, Michael, for bringing that up. Obviously, you saw it. You got to look look through all of them. There's a lot of them. There is, um, there's a playlist of 77. There's a playlist of 63. And there's another 100 and some odd. So there's a lot of videos to look through. But thank you, Michael, for bringing it up. I appreciate it. Okay, folks, any more questions? I got out there about Kurt Hansen. So little is known about him. I, I One of the things that I also, I was his best man at his wedding way before all this started, long time ago. One of the things I, I really stands out in my mind about him was when he was dating uh, Sam Stefano's daughter. And he married Mario Stefano's mistress. Um, Kurt lived a very different <clears throat> life, so to speak. He had some different attitudes about certain, certain things. Uh, what are we looking for up here? John Wayne read. What did you think of Lefty, and did you think Robert De Niro played him realistically? Yes, I do. And what did I think of Lefty? He was a very clever man, extremely clever. He, he became an FBI informant in 1964 before he even went to Las Vegas. Hmm. 
Bobby Vega Donuts. Red, if you could go back in those times, is there anything that you regretted doing or not doing? We all have regrets. Um, I did some things that I considered to be very wrong, and I regret those. But I did a video on that too, Bobby. Bobby Vega Donuts. Um, as far as major decisions, no, I don't regret them. I did what I did. I had the impact that I wanted to have, and uh, a lot of people were pleased. I got a lot of thanks from victims, uh, families. Uh, Big Tuna 815, did Kurt ever tell you why he fired you from the yak? Uh, I was working for $25 a week, room and board, living in the facility. He had maybe 10 rooms there, and he had the Lincoln Motel across the street. Um, he told me that I slept too late in the morning. And uh, he knew that I had seen him hurt somebody, kill him, that he beat him to death. So I hope that answers your questions. Genetic Memory Farms. What were Kurt's attitudes and opinions you speak of? I don't know what you're asking there, guy, but I can't help you. One last thing, uh, Mike Graham. One last thing about the Schusler peterson Boy, a murders, a murder. Why did they have to testify? Shoot, I missed you. One last thing about the Schusler Peterson boy murder. Why didn't they have you testify about? It? I did testify about it. I testified in the first trial and the second trial. There was an appeal. If you look it up under Wikipedia, my name, Red We Met. It says William we met was an FBI informant. And if you go through there, there's a little spot as you go down for references, and it shows appeals. And you'll see my testimony in that appeal. Michael Graham, that's your answer. Oh, we jumped up here. Joe Clark. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Brian Brown, cheering me up. <laughs> Mom's death. I'm sorry about your mom, Ryan. I really am. Tony V, who was the most high profile? Gangster in Chicago that was a confidential informant back in my day, Lefty Rosenthal. I think he was the most high-ranking, or most important, anyway. Mm -hmm. Tachi Cho, Tony V, Chicago Heights had strong ties to Capone. They both spent a lot of time and money in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And they both spend a lot of time in Willow Springs also. Glenn Page, Red, did you ever have any brushes with your death? Brushes with death as in your book on Chicago days. Red, did you ever have any brushes with death? No, not really. Uh, Kurt shot at me a lot. But we, we rectified that. I was actually going to quit, walk away. And Marshall Cofano said, no way. He said, you're going to run things. You're the boss from now on. Uh, and after that, when you walk next to Marshall and you walk down the street, people notice who you are. And they have a tendency to treat you with respect. And uh, Marshall was a, a force to be reckoned with. John O, who would win a fight? 
Kurt or Frank Schweiss? Frank Schweiss. Or Frank Schweiss would beat him to death. As a matter of fact, um, Mark Milton, a friend of mine on Facebook, who was a, a, a Cook County deputy sheriff, told me he tuned him up a couple with his flashlight, Kurt Hansen. He took him out of the car and just, you know, tuned him up. So he said, okay, use your own imagination on that one. Ryan Brown. Red, thank you for such an amazing content. I'd love to meet you someday. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. No, uh, outfit boss. Uh, nobody, the Hansons were gone by then. Family Secrets was in 2007. Uh, this is ancient history. It really is. But it was so little talked about him that I thought you guys might want to know about him. We did that one. Okay, we'll do this one. These mobsters, though tough, son of a bitch is red. What was your opinion on Joey the Clown? Was he a likable or an asshole? Um, my opinion was he was very likable. Uh, if you crossed him, he could be probably the worst enemy. I mean, very dangerous guy. And at the time I knew him, he wouldn't have to do it himself. All he'd do is point and somebody else would do it. They'd either work you over or eliminate you peacefully for the rest of your life, <laughs> whatever life you had left. Randy Rhodes. Hey, Red, who scared you the most out of all the wise guys? None of them. None of them scared me. I wasn't afraid of any of them. I will tell you this, Ryan, or Randy Rhodes. Um, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid, but I was cautious because I knew what they were capable of. It's like reaching in and grabbing a rattlesnake. If you know how to do it, it's okay. You're just cautious. That's all. Philip Wright, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you here. Hey, you guys, hit that like and subscribe, huh? Please. I need all the help I can get. If you're enjoying the show. Uh, <laughs> hey, Red, what did you think of the Johnny Jeff uh, trial today? You know, I haven't been following it, Greg. Greg Froman. Froman. I haven't been following it. John O. Are some of the background muscle guys still around? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. It's a whole new breed now. Yes, Ryan, you're right. Gene O'Shea. And Gene O'Shea worked for the Southtown Economist. And he sat in on the trial. Uh, he was kind of given privy to information by the ATF. Um, he, he was... Uh, he was pretty pretty good at, at writing what he did uh, out of all the books. Jimmy Jack was the, uh, the worst book I ever saw. Um, description, he referred to Hanson as the obese hitman. Yes, he was obese and he was a hitman. And he was dangerous, very dangerous. Tony V, how often did I see Hanson after you saw him kill somebody? Oh, it's hard to say, maybe 25, 30 times. Alan uh, Jumea, I think you're talking about Johnny Batassa. 
or Pudgy, as we used to call him. You're mentioning his name, but that's about it. Chain Weaver. I always hit the like button on the way in, so I don't forget. Thank you, Chain Weaver. I really appreciate it, guy. I really do. God bless all of you. John Wayne, great show, Red. Thank God you got out live. The mobsters would say, <laughs> yeah, they would scare you. Great stories. I have a lot of stories, guy. I really do. The agents that I talk to and um, some of the victims, uh, relatives and families that I talk to, they really marvel at some of my stories. So that's what I did. Ryan Brown. Everyone should give Red a hug. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. God bless you, buddy. What crew did Hanson work for? I described that earlier. I, Ken Hanson worked for, uh, or Kurt Hanson, worked for the uh, uh, Fifi Bouchieri, and he also worked for uh, Jimmy Katura out in the Heights, out in that area. Actually, he introduced me to uh, Jimmy Katura. Randy Rhodes. Hey, Red, did, did Kirk kill any children? No, Kurt, Kurt C-U-R-T, did not. He did not. He liked children. He was like a Santa Claus. Hey, Adam, how you doing? Hit the like button, everybody. Adam, Adam's with us. Greg Froman, should ask people to share your videos on live streams and other social media pages, Red. Why don't you ask them for me, buddy? Joe Clark. Red, do you ever think about doing some live shows telling your stories? I'm sure it would be popular. Yeah, I did think about it. I, this is one of them. Ryan Brown saying hello to my vlog. You're saying hi to Adam. Okay. We'll be doing a show on Wednesday. And probably all you're going to show up, I guess. Bobby Bag of Donuts says hi. And Joe Clark says hi. Interesting question. Um, I, I can't pronounce your name. Kev I-N-D? Kevin did? Um, Red, where I, was I? Red, were you in witness protection uh, at the time the outfit documentary where your face was blocked out? No, I was not in witness protection. Um, they paid me for that interview, and I was in the... I, I went through what they call the undercover division of the FBI. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about that also in my book, buddy. I, um, I didn't go through WITSEC at all. Michael Graham, how you doing, Adam? Hey, buddy. I take it you're on a tour. <laughs> hmm. Adam's got great tours. When I was out in Las Vegas, he took me on all the tours, the Ghost Springs tour. Um, he's added a, 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 an event, but um, his mob tour is fantastic. It really is. He's got a new surprise coming up. He'll be talking about his tours um, in a video. Great guy. 
Okay. John Ramsey. Hey, Red, you said you grew up in the Quad Cities. No, I didn't say that. I said I lived in the Quad Cities. Mm -hmm. um, John Ramsey. Uh, was it a culture shock to move to the big city like Chicago? No, I lived from in Chicago, and I moved to the Quad Cities. And I wrote about it in my book. Hit the like button always. Thank you. I'm glad you did it. Tony V, saw you with Chuck Maselli. Good show. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I really am. I can't pronounce your first name. Covered. Hi. He's saying hi to you, Adam. And uh, that's the way it is. All Gold Productions, you're in the Quad Cities right now, or Rock Island. Well, I'm very Adam, you're coming in. You want me to bring you in? You can add, you can, Adam's coming on the show, guys. Larry, was John no no the president when they killed the Splasher Brothers? Yes, he was. He was upstairs in the living room. Um, they fed him drinks. And his brother. D is your middle name. Okay. I didn't know that. Michael Graham is saying, 82 out of 5 have hit the like button. That's great. That's that's great, guys. I really like it. Adam, are you coming in? You want me to bring you in? Come on. How's it going? There Ray? we go. <laughs> yeah, here's Adam, man. Can you hear me all right? <laughs> yeah, you're fine. <laughs> I'm I'm not doing a tour today. I'm actually sitting here. Um, I'm editing right now. Ah, uh, working on a project. I was so, just telling the folks about your new uh, uh, tour video, but I didn't go into any detail about it. Oh, no. You want to see it? Yeah. Put it up. Here. Check this out. Watch this. Join us aboard the Vegas Mob Tour. Experience the city of Carnival. Learn how Bugsy Siegel and the Find out. We can't hear it. Really? Yeah. Can't hear it? No. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, that's not going to work. Maybe it's we gonna... have to. Be, maybe we have to be muted in in order for that to play. No, I think uh, I think I just need to uh, um, share audio. Join us aboard the Vegas Mob Tour. Experience Sin City's dark past. Learn how Bugsy Siegel built the Flamingo. Find out who killed him and why. Hear who Jimmy Hoffa supplied money to in the 50s to start Las Vegas. Visit the home used in Casino. See the real jewelry store where Frank Collada and the Hole in the Wall gang were busted. Sit in the exact spot where Frank Lefty Rosenthal's car was bombed back in 1982. View never before seen footage of Frank Collada telling personal stories. This is how serious we thought he saw. It's almost like a peach color. It was brown then. The only thing changed is the driver. Let us make you an offer you can't refuse. Be sure to upgrade to the Untouchables experience. And following the tour, you'll enjoy a three course dinner at the Tuscany Gardens and VIP seating at the Rat Pack is Back show inside the Copa room. So 
Super guy. Super. That's like it's like twelve hours of sitting there editing. That's what I got to get off my lazy ass, man. I'm sitting in front of this computer all the time. <laughs> I'm sitting there driving the van, or I'm sitting here at the computer driving the computer. It's unbelievable. Uh, how's everybody's doing? Thanks well, for Joe the Clark nice hat, William Kirch. It's how's the weather today over there? It's mild. It's mild. in the high seventies. Well, that's not bad. Joe Clark says that's great, Adam. Oh, she likes thanks, Joe. She likes a lot. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I'm still working on it, guys. That's kind of a rough draft, so I'm still messing with it. And once I get the script finalized, then I'll get the voiceover done and all that. So, okay. Anyway, we have a, a comment from Ryan Brown. Red talk about the height difference in my sister, 5'0, and my brother in law is 6'8. Kind of like Adam. <laughs> Adam, 6'5. <six>, <laughs> Your sister's five foot and your brother in law is six eight. So, yeah, so they don't line up either way. No, not at you know all. I mean? That's like Danny DeVito, you know what I mean? With a real yeah. tall girl. When they're toe to toe, his nose is in. And when they're nose to nose, his toes is in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should keep it clean. I'm sorry. So, Adam, um, keep the beard. You look better with the beard. I, yeah. I shaved a little too short last week. That's all. It's growing back. Hair comes back. It was a back. mistake. That's all. He went, eat. And oh, wow. <laughs> now, how can I clean it up? <laughs> <laughs> there I'm you go. That happens. Guessing, guys. Man, I, yeah. So, John uh, Ramsey. Hey, Adam and Red, are you going to have John Drummond on again? Um, Maybe. It's just a phone call away, right? Yeah, I got to give him a call. That's a that's a phone call away. Um, wow. So with that cap on, Adam looks like it's about to drive a taxi cab. <laughs> yeah, Adam the taxi cab driver. I was just looking at that. You know, Martin Scorsese, he did the taxi taxi, the movie taxi with uh, De Niro Red. Yeah. Yeah, that was Martin Scorsese's movie, and then so was Goodfellas, and so was Casino, and so was Aviator. That was another good yes, one. Yes, and that was a great one. Yeah. yeah. He's done so many good movies. So Howard Hughes has always been one of my fascinating characters. Yeah, yeah. Howard's an interesting guy. <clears throat> you know what Howard Hughes did out here in Vegas, Red, back in the 60s? Yeah, he stayed in his hotel room. <laughs> he stayed in his hotel room going crazy, okay? But listen to this. Howard Hughes back in uh, the 60s, so he... He, he came to town in Vegas the first time in the 50s. He was test piloting some airplanes out at Lake Mead. He crashed, right? He stayed in a little house. We go past it on the mob tour. Stayed in this little house out on the strip, and it's still there. But when we was at the KLAS, uh, at the Desert Inn, at the DI, back in uh, the, I think it was 63 or 64, he came to town Thanksgiving Eve in a private locomotive pulling a private compartment car. And he was in it, and, and he checked into the top of the DI, and Mo Daylitz rented it out to him. Said the whole thing for him and his Mormon workers. Well, he didn't want to leave, so he bought the DI and stayed there. But this is like <laughs> crazy recluse. The DI is the desert inn. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah, the desert inn. And he's nutty, Howard Hughes. He's up there at the top of the DI, and he's got he can't cut his fingernails, can't cut his hair, he can't put clothes on because it well, hurts also, his skin. Also, he had his chef's. Cook. He wanted his food cooked by his chefs in the kitchen. And the union said, they're not union. Oh, really? I didn't hear about that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, they stopped making his meals. So I had to make them on his floor, in the same floor, in, in one of the rooms. He oh. was a burden. He spent the money, but they wanted him out of there. They had some reservations, you know, for other people that would come back. So, 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 and he kept so, buying the casinos up left and right. Well, he was going up and down buying them, but he bought KLAS Channel 8 television in town and he turned it into a 24 7 movie channel and it's commercial free. So you could sit there at home and you could tune in the movies and the rabbit ears at home. But everybody said it was crazy because you'd be watching a movie and whoop, it'd jump back 15 minutes and you go, What the hell just happened? Or you'd watch in the middle of a movie and whoop, another movie would start. He called. Hey, what's going on down there at the station? Oh, Mr. Hughes had to go to the bathroom. We had to back the movie up for him. And Mr. <laughs> Hughes wanted to watch a different movie, so we put on something different. Yeah, 
The people said it was nuts. This guy was, he was insane. You know, at one point he was obsessed with the um, uh, Baskin Robbins banana nut flavored ice cream. And so Baskin Robbins announced they were going to discontinue making banana nut and ice cream. He bought 350 gallons of it. 350 wow. gallons had it sit there. They had to build extra refrigeration at the Desert Inn to store the ice cream. And then he decided he didn't like banana nut and ice cream anymore. So for two years, the Desert Inn gave away free banana nut ice cream to people. <laughs> Get rid of it out of the freezer. Uh, Alfred Boss says, Red and Adam, I think you should do a Jimmy Cozo. That would be a good topic on Wednesday. It might be. Do you want to do Jimmy Cozo? Sure. I, and we can play like Anthony it. Anthony's clip of the uh, spot. Sure. Remember that spot, the clip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we could talk about Jimmy Boy and his father, Jelly Billy, and the Richard Kane murder and everything. That sounds good. That's what you and want to do this week. Okay, we'll do it. Okay, I can do that. Sounds good to me. I have to sit and uh, work on a thumbnail and uh, get everything together. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Here we go, Rick Carlton. I've eaten 500 gallons of Bluebell. <laughs> Bluebell, man, that's stuff. You know, that's a good ice cream. Yeah, that it is. Uh, Di Porzalo, the Sicilians call that head a copola. Really, it's a copola, huh? A Coppola. I never heard that. I always thought it was called, called a flat cap. You know, a cap. Here's something I didn't know. Ice cream has a two-year shelf life. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Uh, the Spruce Goose was his plane. He built it out of wood. That's correct, Ryan. Uh, yes. Out of spruce wood, which is, you know, spruce, pine. It was cheap. Really? <laughs> really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Spruce goose. That's why they called it the spruce goose. That's actually something that's searched a lot. Really? Mm hmm. Spruce goose was airborne for 30 seconds, 25 feet above the harbor. How much of the spruce goose is made of wood? Despite its name, almost the whole aircraft is made from birch. Birch? Specifically, duramold, a wood lamination process that produces strong plywood. I'll bet he invented it. Maybe. Maybe. The spruce goose was the largest plane in the world. Yes. That's what now I, I think there's bigger planes though now than oh, from yeah. the first goose. Oh yeah. Right? Oh yeah. I mean, what's the what's the world's largest plane? It's a Russian plane. I think you're right. It is a Russian plane. I think it is, yeah. An N 225 Maria Maria. Maria. It's a Soviet Union. Ukraine SSR. Built by Antonov Serial Production Plant. What was the where's the picture of this thing? Oh yeah, that's a gigantic plane. <laughs> Holy shit, man! He actually transport fighters in it. That plane actually takes fighter you planes. Put, you, you, you could put planes inside this plane, right? That's insane. That's crazy. You know how many wheels this thing has to land? Uh, Here's something that's very interesting. Uh, the Spruce Goose is on display. I can't pronounce what's your name. Uh, it, here we it go. Is. I read that somewhere. It's in a museum somewhere. They had to they had to take it across the. I, I watched a little documentary about it. Yeah, I actually watched the live footage when he flew it. Now look at how many look how many wheels are on that Russian plane. That's the biggest plane in the world, right there. Yeah, well, the, the, how many the landing gear on that? That's something that's incredible. It needed a lot of legs to land. Look at the two front ones. Yeah. And There's those aren't little. Those are, big, those are gigantic wheels. I mean, that, that's crazy. I wonder how much mileage it gets. <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. That's something. That Scott, is really H, Scott H says... Uh, uh, Ukrainians blew one up. Yeah. Really? Yeah, they did. Oh, 
I see that on um, photos from Ukraine show wreckage of the largest airplane. Oh, my gosh. When did this happen? 2022, April 4th. This just happened, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think Russia's taking a beating on this war. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. Yeah, look at that. They, they they totally blew the thing up. Look at the wreckage of that. We won't have to deal with that. That's oh, a big beat in the ass right there. Look at all the running gear, the landing gear. <laughs> yeah, look at all of it. It's crazy. Uh, That's a big plane, man. That's a big plane. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so... Anyway, you were doing having a great show, and then I showed up. That's it's still great. We're glad to see you. How many people were glad to see Adam? Everybody said, "Hey, Adam!" When they say when you made a comment, so I said, "Well, come on." And then when you, I saw Adam in the studio, and I said, "Adam, come on in." It was originally named the Hercules. He hated the name the Spruce Goose. I never yes. heard about that. He, and not only wow. that, the Hercules plane, the Spruce Goose, or whatever. Uh huh. Uh, if you look at the C-130s, they're modeled right after the Spruce Goose, only they're not made in wood. Same right. model. Same model. Yeah. Good engineering, good designing. Bobby Banks, way don't have to it ain't Russian no more. <laughs> no, it sure isn't. <laughs> that, that'll buff right out. <laughs> of course he's <laughs> landing. <laughs> No problem. Uh, we'll just buff it uh, out. Yeah, right. It'll be okay in the morning. <laughs> I'll never forget when we were in a car going to Great America one day. There was like six of us, and we were in this tiny little car. It was a little Honda. And uh, there were six of us because there was two in the front, and there were four in the back, three sitting, and then one girl laying across the three of us. And we we're going to go to Great America. We didn't get two blocks from the guy's house, and he, boom, ran right into the back of a big pickup truck. Truck tire ended up on top of the hood, okay? Wow. He backed the car out, right? We all got out of the car, and his girlfriend's looking at the hood. It's crushed in. It's fiberglass. It's crushed in. Don't Stand worry. There. We'll bump it out in the morning. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. She's dead, is it? It's going to pop back out. It'll pop out. It's going to pop out by itself. It'll pop up. I'm sitting there going, hey, hey, popping up, all right? It's just a little bit of it. It pops out. The damn truck was on top of the car. Randy, Randy Brooks, I agree with you. Let me hit this here. Yeah, wow. He was way ahead of his time. Like all geniuses, he was eccentric. <laughs> he was also on a lot of opiates from all the airline crashes. He was his own talent. Well, yeah, he was, you know, but... Uh, he, he got hurt. Yeah. Wouldn't you think you'd have somebody else, you know what I mean, do the original... For you. Oh, Howard, he, he didn't end up so good in the end. No. Howard, not at all. That's no, when, you got to tear your nails everything. They even when, when he actually died on the plane, it really killed me because I listened to the story. He was having cancer, and the machine he designed was this, and that was the machine. And it was back yeah. Mm. So, wow. He Hughes was involved in it. According to reports, he thinks that he's still hundreds of years old as president. I think about what? Uh, I don't know where you heard that, but uh, Nixon's reelection team was concerned about Robert Mayhew, Howard Hughes, director yep. of operations. Yep. Apparently tight with Larry O'Brien, a key Democratic strategist. It was O'Brien's telephones that the Watergate burglars were trying to tap. Aha! See? So maybe he was involved somehow. You're probably right. I was. He wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't loyal to one political party or another. Instead, he used his enormous wealth and clout to support whatever project or ideology struck his fancy. And he wasn't above bribing people to get his way. According to reports, he gave Richard Nixon personal gift of honor grand. See? So, hmm. Where there's money, Red, there's going to be corruption. Oh, everywhere. 
Where there's money, there's corruption. You can guarantee it. I've always talked about that. Corruption starts at the bottom, not the top. Sure does. Sure does. Yeah. Big Tuna Hughes was a weird dude. <laughs> That's putting it lightly, Big Tuna. That's yeah. an understatement, guy. <laughs> exactly, right? Really, really, really. You guys are buffering bad. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's... Uh, I, I'm showing one signal strength out of three over here on this end. That's right what it is. You're frozen. I'm frozen? Yeah. Well, sometimes. Sometimes you freeze. Um. Yeah, let me shut down some things that might be tying up bandwidth. You got a lot opened. <laughs> I probably do. Sorry about that. I'm I'm guessing I do, and that's probably the problem. Las Vegas. Okay. What brand of cigarettes do I smoke? <laughs> God. This is ridiculous. I smoke Marlboro Ultralight 100s. And no, I'm not giving them up. Everybody wants Red to quit smoking. Red doesn't want to quit smoking. No. And you know, you can't stop somebody from doing something that they don't want to stop doing. That's true. And at my age, I think I've earned it. <laughs> you think you you think you're entitled? Is that what you're saying? I do. You I think really you're entitled. Do. Mm. <laughs> I've earned the right to do whatever I want to do as long as I don't hurt anybody else. Okay, man, you've been alive this time. I mean, why not? I'm going to do a show in the can about that uh, that guy uh, that uh, Mark that I told you about. Uh huh. I decided to do the show with him. Anthony D. Martini doesn't know enough about the subject, so I'll do it myself and put it up. I don't know if we're going to do it live or not. But it's about Ken Hansen. He worked at the uh, stables, and he had flashbacks. And he sent me a uh, a instant message about it, and told me we actually talked on the phone then, and he told me all about it. Okay, this is in the way. Keep smoking, Red. Switch to organics or cigars. <laughs> I used to smoke cigars. I really didn't like them, honestly. Cigars? Yeah, I did. I, Anthony, smoke, you know, I smoke cigars every once in a while. I don't smoke Anthony, too often. I used to chew on them all the time. I always had one in my mouth. I like it every, uh, you know, maybe a couple of months. Scott, Arm Scott Armstrong. State uh, of the Union to Crown Point, Indiana, and business once. Can you share the nature of that business and who you visited, if you recall? It was his wedding. We drove to Crown Point, Indiana to get him married. I was best man at his wedding. Didn't Big Tuna have a ham sandwich? Back? That was Joey Ayupa, Randy Rhodes. Yeah. But now he's whacking peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, last I heard. He's gotten mild. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Vegas, get a contact high anywhere you walk. Plenty of pot. Rick Charlton, you are correct. Uh, yes, just walk down the halls of the Venetian. <laughs> I figured it out. No, I figured it out. You don't have to go to the dispensary when you come out here. Just go to the parking garage. Okay. Everybody's out there smoking in the parking garage. Walk to the parking garage. Breathe in, breathe out. You had the munchies in no time. Adam, tell them the truth. We were walking down the hallway to my room at yeah. the Venetian. Wasn't there an a abundance of odor coming from underneath the door? You could smell the weed. Oh, you could smell pot coming out. Oh, yeah, everywhere. We went, I took Red out to Fremont Street to show him the light show up in the sky. And we were standing out there and a guy, 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 guy tried to pass me a blunt standing right there on the street. I mean, it's like everywhere in this town. It's unbelievable. At the Blum Blum dispensary in town, they have a 24 hour a day drive through. This way, in the middle of the night, if you get a craving for some of the devil's lettuce, you don't have to get on your clothes. You could get in your jammies, get in your car, and go through the drive through. The drive through. 
if you have the app on the phone, they they put it together for you. So yeah. You store, you just pick it up. That's it. Easy as that. Easy peasy. See. Pretty wild. So, and I'm just sitting here today, by the way, guys. I didn't have any of my lights on. I just jumped in to say hi to everybody and uh, say hi to Red. Uh, I mean, I honestly, I, I really don't even have a, I don't even really have a background going right now. You know, yeah. just kind of like, ah, you and no Adam, light, no light, I'm just like sitting in, in the room. Adam, this is a question Yeah. Uh, about weed. Uh, do we hit the bong together? We never have. <laughs> no. We didn't have time. Oh, my gosh. Come on, Robert. 0969. What are you thinking? Got bong. Jesus. You know what they did, though? They were going to have it open the lounge downtown, and they were going to make a – it's supposed to be a two-story bong. It's supposed to be 24 feet long. Wow. Bong. Somebody at the bottom, down at the bottom, lights, and then you – and they were going to have that one of the lounges here in town, downtown. I read that somewhere. That was a while ago. I don't think they opened it yet. Maybe they did. But it was a two-story building with a two-story bong. I don't even think you could clear one of those. Bill Kirschmeyer, I like this one. C-Store cigarettes at $2.50 a carton in 1968. Well, I got you beat, buddy. In, 19, in 1978, you said. In 1968... We used to pay a dollar a carton for them at the Marine Corps Exchange. Holy oh, cow. Ten a cents dollar. a pack. Dollar a carton. A dollar a carton. That's unbelievable. Marlboro Times have changed. Times yeah. have changed. <laughs> do they still do that, the Marlboro Bucks, when you tear the thing off the side of the cigarette pack? Do they still have Marlboro Bucks? I don't know. And then you can, like, buy a pool table if you get enough Marlboro Bucks together. You're like, I yeah. saved up. Not on my thousand Marlboro bucks. <laughs> I got myself a free pool table. I had a friend, Adam, who lives, who lives in Chicago. I still talk to him. He um, he's a magician, and Adam uh, worked for Marlboro, doing the cigarette promotions, the magic with the cigarettes, and uh, his whole house was filled with Marlboro stuff. So I gave all the stuff to him. You know, he had Marlboro pool table sticks, pool balls, the pool table. Yeah, everything in his house is Marlboro. It's crazy. He must have smoked a lot. <laughs> no bong rips or tater chips for the guys. <laughs> bong are bad for your memory. It's true, Bill. They are. So, and what were you saying, Red? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, I'm looking at the comments here. Uh, Chain Weaver. Um, 74, and, and 74 in Frankfurt, Illinois, where Kurt Hansen had the Valley, Valley View Yak, they were $1.50 a, a pack, and that's true. So street stories, you serious? They're a dollar a cigarette, they're twenty dollars a pack in Chicago. Twenty no. bucks a pack. Come on. I mean, in Vegas, I've seen them over 10. Um, you know, the the gas station and, and whatnot. They're a hundred and twenty dollars in Canada, a wow. carton for a carton. That's got to be for 10, 10 packs, right? Right. Twelve so bucks a pack. 12, Twelve bucks a pack. <laughs> that's unbelievable. A carton of cigarettes costs as much as the pool table itself. No kidding, right? No kidding. Yeah. Uh, did you ever smoke Camel Straights? No. I stick to one brand. Before this, I smoked something that I don't think any of you know about. Oh, it's man. called Now. Now cigarettes. They took them off the market. But they were made by <laughs> Philip Morris. And they were the latest things that... You know what? Nobody ever bummed a cigarette for me. Do you know why? They were too light. One guy said he was going to, you know, have a hernia from, <laughs> from sucking on it because it was too light. He wanted more oh nicotine, evidently. Oh, my God. $11.20V. They're 11 packs, $11 a pack down the street. I had a hot dog for breakfast today, Red. Hot dog with eggs. With eggs. I chopped up the hot dog, put it in a pan, and I made some eggs with it. Catherine Guerrero sent me an email. Yeah, she sent me one, too, with all the damn all the hot dogs, oh, and every one of them had ketchup on it. And so it just made me think about it. I was just going through and looking at messages and she's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Cupid, mustard, onions, and chili. The Chicago's got mustard, onions, neon relish, tomatoes, sport peppers, pickles, celery, salt. 
Listen to this one. A Reuben hot dog, mustard, cheese, and sauerkraut. No. Who puts cheese with sauerkraut? It doesn't no. sound right. Triangle, mustard, onions, and relish. In the veggie, plant-based beyond sausage. Make it your way. We love mustard, purple, cabbage, and kraut. Ow. On a plant-based beyond sausage hot dog. No, thank you. That's okay. Scott H. says it right here. <laughs> Ketchup on Scott H says ketchup on a hot dog is gross. I agree, but then again, I grew up that way. I don't know. I put ketchup and mustard on mine sometimes. You put ketchup on yours? Sometimes. I, sometimes I don't know. You know, I know it's sacrilege, but sometimes it's not a sacrilege. You, hey, enjoy it. Enjoy it, Adam. I'm not putting sauerkraut on my hot dog though with damn cheese. Look at that. Who does that? Cupid's hot dogs. That's who does it right there. That's the picture that <laughs> picture Catherine sent me. See that? Who does that? Unbelievable. Well, it's time for us to say goodbye, Adam. Okay, I gotta go too. I uh, gotta we, go uh, get ready. I was gonna kill. We're an me. hour and twenty minutes in here, so I figured it's best to say thank you for stopping by, Adam. Nice thank to all see you folks right. for stopping by. Adam will be Wednesday. Are we gonna do? Um, what, who Kozo? Who? Kozo. What are you hitting the bong red? Yeah. You can't remember? Kozo? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm reading the comments, so I forget. <laughs> Jimmy Kozo. That would be great. So, I thought Red, red looked offended, too, when I said that. That's what I thought. <laughs> you put ketchup on your hot dog guy? <laughs> Jerk Clark, we, we will see you Wednesday, too, I hope. Good, good. Thank you, everybody, for stopping by. All of you people. I love you. I love you. And ben Adam, Bond. thank you for stopping by. Big surprise. Yeah. Surprise guest. <laughs> hey, always. You love have a great you. day. God bless you. For years, he was an informant spilling the secrets of the Chicago mob to the FBI. The story of Red Women. I was told by some people at the time they put out a million dollar contract on my head